Hi, I'm Claire Gray. I'm a professor in chemistry at the University of Cambridge. I'm interested in environmental issues and environmental chemistry. And over the years, I've worked on a number of issues and areas, but at the moment, my focus is mostly on batteries and on fuel cells. And I'm interested in understanding how the materials that make a battery work function and how to optimize and improve them. I'm interested in NMR spectroscopy because it gives you a measure or insight into the local ordering around an atom or an ion. And so many people, of course, are familiar with that in the context of MRI, where you look at water and protons in the body. But I'm interested in my applications in, for example, where the lithium ions are. So lithium, ion, lithium ions in a battery are critical to how it works. So I want to know, are the ions in the cathode or are they in the anode or are they the electrolyte? How are they moving? And so the specific things NOR gets at are the local structure. So that I, by that, I mean the nature of the atoms and ions around the nucleus. In this case, it could be lithium. And it also gives you a measure of the dynamics. So how fast the ions are moving in the structures or the liquids that are important for the battery. So a large fraction of my group is working on battery research. And so one of the things that I lead is a UK activity on battery degradation. So if you want a, your car to last longer, so you've bought this expensive battery and, and you don't want it to die in the next couple of years, you really want it to last the length of your car. So in order to, under, to figure out how to get them to last longer, you have to work out why they fail. And so that's called battery degradation. And so that involves understanding how the materials fail, the liquids, the electrolytes fail. And so we're using NMR with a whole variety of different techniques to study that. And then the other thing that we try and do is to understand how batteries work while they're being cycled. So when you plug your battery into the electrical socket, you know, what happens to the ions? How do they move from one side to the other? So we've developed what we call operando NMR of batteries or in situ NMR, where you have these tiny little batteries that are smaller than the sort of coin cell or the batteries that you might have remember years ago in your cameras, they're closer in size to the types of batteries that you might have in a hearing aid. So they're very small and we can put them inside the NMR spectrometer and then we can attach the leads and then we can cycle them and we can watch what the lithium ions get up to. And we want to do that for a number of reasons. We might want to understand safety aspects. So if you charge too fast, you can, instead of in inserting lithiums into different structures, you can form metal dendrites, so little lithium filaments that could short circuit your battery and result in some of the battery fires that you see. So we can see that directly of NMR. So those are the sorts of things that we are trying to do. And that's just a sort of brief overview. We're also not looking at just lithium. We look at sodium batteries because sodium is another very good NMR nucleus. So I think research into batteries is critical for a number of reasons. First of all, we're all so familiar with batteries in portable electronics, be it our mobile phones or our laptops, you know, and that's really been, was, the batteries have really underpinned the whole electronics revolution. Yes, we've had massive increase, increases in electronics, but it's the ability to power them that has enabled our mobile world. But if you look forward and you think, well, wh where are the big challenges? The big challenges are, you know, without a doubt in climate change. And then if you, want to make an impact in climate change there you know, there are many ways to do it but certainly reduction and burning of fossil fuels is, is a pivotal one and one of the ways to do this is to electrify transport and so there the battery plays a very obvious role the other area that's much more challenging is in grid storage and trying to in order to use more renewables on the grid so to move away from fossil fuels and we're all you know, critically aware of that at the moment, the, the reliance on gas and um, petrol, is, and it's not only a climate change issue, it's an energy security issue. And so there you need to be able to build more renewables, you need to put more wind and solar on the grid, and of course they're intermittent. And they can be intermittent in terms of short-term uh, fluctuations, so when the sun goes behind the cloud or when everybody comes home after work, they, in the UK, they put their kettle on and the joke is that's when the biggest surge in demand is. And in reality, it's because there's this intersection between industry needs and home needs that happen at that particular time. So you need to have some form of storage that switches on quickly. I mean, over the years, what's been critical has been the development of very fast magic angle spinning probes. And so when I started, we were spinning at we were lucky we had a probe that spun to 20 kilohertz. 
And now we know we're up at 100 kilohertz, although in my lab, not quite as fast as that. And why that's important is that many of the materials I look at are paramagnetic, which means they have unpaired spins. To step back, you know, where are the biggest challenges in material science? They are about complex materials. It's not just one material, it's how one material interacts with another one. And one could be solid, one could be a semi-solid. And really what, where the, the field is, is understanding at the interfacial structures. And in batteries, how one iron moves from one structure to another. And so that's a challenge for NMR because it's a low, you know, it's, it's not, NMR is a bulk technique. It sees the whole material. And so you want to optimize your methodology. So you look at where you want to be looking at. And so there are ways to do that. And I think DNP is one possibility, but that's not the only way. You can do double and triple resonance experiments that might target the specific combinations of nuclei. So I talked about this idea of grid storage needing big batteries. And it's difficult to imagine if you have a battery that's this size, you know, trying to make a battery that's going to power the grid or fractions of the grid, even for minutes, you know, that's making a battery pack that's three times the size of my room. You know, that gets you for minutes, but if you want hours, then it's going to be a monstrous battery. And so one of the ways you can think about doing this is in something called redox flow batteries. And so there you would have a big vat so maybe a, a, a tank the size of, of some, a tank in a brewery or a tank in an oil refinery, and that's full of oxidized material. Then you have another tank of reduced material. So one's an anode and one's a cathode. And when you want electricity, you flow them into the electrochemical cell, and then you, you get electrons and then you get energy. And so that allows you to scale things much bigger in a sort of linear way rather than having to have lots of different batteries. And so what we've devised or we've been doing recently is to do what's known as online NMR. So where you flow the liquids through the NMR spectrometer, and then you can watch what's going on. And you can understand things like how those liquids are degrading, how the molecules inside are dying or breaking apart, or you can monitor how far the reaction's gone. And so there, those are not only metrology designs from the companies, those have come from within our lab, but often working quite closely with companies. In the battery field, I think it's clear to most people that if we're going to electrify our life, for that to be possible for all of humanity, batteries have to be cheaper and they have to last longer. And so in order to do or to make batteries that target will achieve those targets, you need to understand how they function and you need to make new materials. And this is a big research field. It involves the people who make and it involves the people who characterize. And by characterize, I mean the people who look at the structures and, and what's inside those batteries. And I'm part of the characterization. And I think through what the NMR that we've been doing, we've been able to have insight into the structures of the materials and how they work that hasn't been possible with other techniques. It's complementary. In other words, you need to have lots of different ways of looking at things, but this has been a particular one. And I think that the analogy is if you go into a hospital and you're ill, maybe you've, um, if you've broken your leg, that's maybe straightforward, but maybe it's more complicated. You know, I, I hate to sort of give this analogy, but maybe you've got a potential tumor. You know, you're not gonna go at it with one technique. You'll put an X-ray in it, you're not gonna see it. Then you're gonna have to do the MRI, and then you're gonna have to do the blood tests. And all of that together is the diagnosis. And I think in batteries, you know, we are the ones who diagnose what's going on at the chemical level and at the local level. And we complement that with the X-rays that tell us in, in the body, it's about hard matter, but in, in, in batteries, it's about how atoms are arranged at a much longer length scale. So, um, so to put it very simply, you know, we would try and understand the chemistry that helps to make batteries cycle more efficiently and to stop them from degrading, so from failing, basically. One of the other things that we're very interested in is improving battery safety and their particular failure modes that NMR can look at that we've developed a way of doing that over the years, which I think is very critical because battery safety is also very much part of widespread adoption of this technology.